All right, one question that I have is, if carnivorous plants can photosynthesize, why do they need to consume animals? Good question. Um, do you want me to answer that one? Or Chris, do you want that one? Or? Oh, no, you got it. I got it, okay. Well, a lot of carnivorous plants have evolved to live in really nutrient poor environments. So uh, environments that most other things can't live. So really acidic water, so think of things like bogs, for example. And there's very little nutrition uh, of certain elements or certain micronutrients they need. So they supplement that by getting it from somewhere else. And that's by those things that fly in. So typically in a bog, you can get all the, the uh, water you need and, and you're, you're able to access certain things. That obviously they're in that water, but uh, everything else that's missing, they're able to track it down from something else. So that's the reason. Awesome. And does the Arboretum sell seeds or do you know of a location that does? Uh, occasionally we have. So we don't do it as a regular activity. Um, we have participated in Guelph CD Saturday a number of times and any seeds that we happen to have in surplus, uh, we have made them available at the Arboretum booth. Uh, obviously that didn't happen last year in 2020. Um, and there's the odd time that we get contacted by, by specialty growers who, uh, particularly nurseries who are trying to grow native plants and, and they want uh, sources where they know that it's from Ontario. So we do that on a case by case basis, but typically we don't sell individual packets. Uh, we just don't really have the, the time or resources to um, kind of process things that way. But uh, the question about, uh, is there a spot that you can buy them? Um, yes and no, depending on what you're looking for. So I'm not sure, are there any specifics uh, you're looking for native perennials or for trees or shrubs or rare plants? Uh, any, any other uh, follow-up on that one that I might be able to help with? I'll see if a follow-up comes in, but so far that was the whole question. Okay, um, sure. Moving on to another question, and we'll wait and see if that person can follow up. Okay. Um, there's another question in the chat. I, I have hop seedlings that I was wondering if you could use them for your plant cell. The hop tree grew from seeds that Madeline Austin brought to my house from Henry Koch workshop in the early 1990s. Oh, neat. No, that's a really neat story. And I think... Um, what I would say is, is our plant cell has been a mix of different things over the years. Certainly a lot of things were, were kind of growing for our own arboreting purposes. And then we sometimes have extras with the odd time that we grow something specifically for the sale. And then uh, over the years with a lot of volunteer connections, we've had some things that come from gardens and kind of donations. And, and obviously if it's appropriate, it's not invasive or something we wouldn't you know, want people to be buying. Um, we can offer that. What I would say right now is we're still a little bit uncertain about what our next plant sale looks like. Uh, really just because of uh, a few things we're kind of uh, regaining some access to our nursery and then also uh, not sure what events even look like in September either so um, so we're I would say that's a maybe and certainly uh, reach out to us and we can kind of uh, keep each other up to date about that over the coming months and then see if it's a 2021 thing or maybe heading into 2022 at this point. So. Awesome thank you. Another question in the chat. Hello, I have a question for Chris. I have a short 20 second recording of a bird singing that I can't identify. Bird stays so high in the trees, I can't ID it by sight. Could I play the recording for you to see if you can recognize the song? Yeah, definitely. Let's try it. So Susan, if you wanna unmute yourself and play the recording to us, hopefully it works out and Chris can help you out with the ID. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna, Press play. Can you hear it at all? Oh, oh, I just heard, I just heard it. So does it go? No, it almost, it, it's, it's warbly and it warbles all down a thing. It's very frustrating. Okay, because I heard I so I can you try playing it again? I heard there was a chickadee um, in yes, there. Yeah, there was a chickadee, um, but this is not okay. a chickadee. Okay, play it, play it one more time, and I'll crank my volume all the way up. That's it. Yeah, I can't pick it up. Can you, Kitty or Jenny? Do you guys are you guys picking it up? I can't hear it. Uh, but Susan, do you have the audio file on your computer or just on your phone right now? It's just on my phone, but I could send it to my computer. All right, because when I was a 
suggest is maybe um, when we have a break, when you're done setting your computer, what you can do is you can share a screen and optimize sound. Um, there's a button you can click when you share a screen and then play it as you share a screen and sound from your computer. And maybe that way we can hear the audio file a little bit better. What about if I emailed it to one of you to try and do that? Sure. That would also work. I will put my email in the chat. <laughs> okay, thank you. If it is warblery, there's, um, there is something called a warbling vireo um, that if it's in a fairly open sort of edge type habitat, it may be, um, uh, especially if it sort of goes up and down as it sings, they sort of do a doo -doo 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 um, so, uh, so yeah, but we'll, we'll try and get that recording. And, uh, when Jenny's got it, we'll, we'll play it and get back to it. Okay. I love questions like that. It happens to me all the time. Here's another question from the chat. I have a 30 year old lemon tree that has been dying for the past few months. It usually drops many leaves as I bring it inside for the winter, but I have a grow light. Usually it grows great outside, but the leaves continue to drop no new growth and leaves are turning white and shiny and going brown. Sprayed for bugs many times, but no help. Thinking root rot, I can share screen pictures. Uh, yeah, Don, I guess what I'd say first and foremost, I don't have a lot of professional experience with, with lemon trees. Most of what we're, we're growing here is hardy. I have a little bit of personal experience, very little. Um, I have a Meyer lemon tree in a pot at home. I kind of do the same thing with. Um, and I can say I can share your experience with, with the leaves dropping uh, both ways sometimes. Uh, uh, simply because that that change in light, they're they're often dropping leaves, so they grow new ones that are either more effective at receiving less light inside, or then vice versa. In the spring, you put them in really bright light, and they're changing those leaves over again. Um, I guess a couple of things: Have you putting it back outside? Is it in a, a brighter location than maybe would be typical? Like uh, you know, instead of moving it uh, from inside to a more shaded location, did it go right to full sun by chance? Um, it did go to an area that gets more sun, but more in the, uh, the end of the afternoon. So it gets full sun probably from about one o'clock, two o'clock on. Okay. Yeah. So nothing drastically different than you've done in the past 30 years <laughs> until it's come back. Eh? So no, it's well, like, I, I grew up from a seed in university, like, I don't know, 37 years ago. And, uh, so it's been with me for a while, but it's still in a planter. So maybe that's, maybe that's it. It's, it's outgrown its area, but I'm also thinking maybe I've just overwatered it at some point and it's root rot because i'm not getting any new growth i still have one lemon hanging on there for its you know as, as best as can but uh, i even tried burying it in my garden so that the uh the pot wouldn't get too dried out in the heavy sun okay uh, but now i've unburied it maybe it maybe it is root rot but i don't know if there's any way to fix it yeah is it in a plastic pot or like a big clay pot or a plastic pot with a bunch of holes drilled around the bottom Okay, so then yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't breathe quite as much if 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 it was overwatered once and it and it's especially if it has started to to, to uh, rot in the roots, it uh, it typically does kind of hold on to that for a while. So I'm not sure if, if you've even noticed uh, how, when the last time you water was, but is it really is it ever drying out in between at this point, uh, or is it staying pretty soggy? Uh, no, it dries out. I, I try to only water it maybe once or twice a week, depending on what the weather is outside. Okay. Right now, it's just like the soil is, It's there's very little soil. It's mostly a giant root ball sort of holding onto the soil. <laughs> right, right. Well, one thing, I'm not sure if you if, if it's easy for a 30-year-old tree, whether you can sort of pop it out of the pot to even see. Um, I mean, the root rot isn't always necessarily evident right around the outside edge, but typically that's where you would start to see that happening. Um, that would give you a bit of a clue. As far as specific diseases that it might be on citrus fruits, that, again, something I'm not really professionally too familiar with. Um, we have a couple citrus relatives in the arboretum, hop trees and, and prickly ash, um, that, that I've never experienced anything quite like that on them, but certainly they're, they're growing outside here year round. So, um, you know, feel free to, to, to share screen pictures. If there's something that kind of rings a bell, I can, I can let you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm an amateur home lemon grower, just like you at this point. <laughs> so. right, let's see if it's gonna let me do this. Oh. I'm not sure if it's gonna let me. No, I'd, I'd, I'd be trying to figure it out right now if I decided to share screens, no worries. 
Okay. What I'll do is I'll send it to uh, Jenny's email if that'll help. Maybe you okay. can open it for me. That sounds great. We can take a look and if it is really immediately evident, I'll let you know for sure. Yeah, it's just weird. I've never seen leaves. They're big and they're green, but they, they turn white in the middle, like shiny silver. And other okay. ones just sort of seem to rot. You know, they go brown and they fall off and things like that. But yeah, no new growth. So I'll send those images over to, uh, to Jenny. Okay, that'd be great. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Alrighty, here's another question. Are there hummingbird moths found in the ARB? Yes. Um, and this year, uh, supposedly, uh, I, I just saw one yesterday in my backyard. Um, this year, it seems to be a really good year for hummingbird moths. I'm getting lots of different reports of them. And uh, we have their food plants. So some of them eat uh, honeysuckle, for example. Um, like, and yeah, so, so definitely we have hummingbird moths. And they look like teeny tiny hummingbirds. Uh, even there, when they stick their proboscis out, which is a, normally curled up, it sort of extends out um, and they fly around. They look like hummingbirds to the point where when hummingbird moths are out uh, in places like England, where there are no hummingbirds, uh, people every year supposed to do all kinds of false reports saying, I have a hummingbird in my garden, but it's actually a hummingbird moth that they, that they have. So um, yeah, so definitely keep your eyes open for those. And you can watch the caterpillars are really beautiful too. So um, if you look up hummingbird um, clear wing or snowberry clear wing uh, caterpillar, you can see some of the photos of them, but they're beautiful caterpillars and you can watch for those as well. So, so yeah, that's great. They are definitely around. Awesome. A uh, question in the chat, which tree do you consider to be the most special at the Arboretum? Sometimes that can be a can't miss for the, something that can be um, can't miss for the visitors. Uh, yeah, are we all gonna answer this one or do you want me to yeah, go, you, you go? You go first and then we'll all answer. Okay, well, I'm gonna cheat here because I get, I get asked this question a lot and I never do have a direct answer because uh, <laughs> I, love, I love too many trees and I feel bad just picking this one, but. Um, I guess what I would say is maybe maybe some can't miss, uh, and I'll say this maybe for the a general visitor who might just be coming to the Arboretum for the first time and they're kind of in the center and looking for different things and a great spot to go is the World of Trees collection, uh, which has a little bit of everything. Um, and I think of, uh, of all the really uh, neat trees, there's a, a spot where you can see quite a few really interesting ones that have uh, neat stories. And I would say around our flying fish bridge, which crosses our stream, kind of in the center of the world trees, there's some really neat things like cucumber magnolias, uh, a magnolia cuminata, which are the first endangered tree to be uh, classified in Canada. So really uh, special to see these big, beautiful, healthy trees in that location. Uh, and if you're looking in the other direction, you can see things like bald cypress, which are uh, typically plants that grow in like the Everglades of Florida and Louisiana. And, and uh, they're hardy here and they have this, you know, beautiful deciduous uh, canopy. So they look like a coniferous, they are a coniferous tree, but they look like a, a tree that would keep its needles all year and evergreen. And they, they drop them and have this uh, beautiful fall color and then these beautiful cypress knees, old cypress knees that come out of the ground. Um, Don Redwood is right beside them, which is uh, kind of like a fossil tree that was thought to be extinct for millions of years and then discovered in the 1940s in China. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of cheating without naming a tree, but I'll name an area because you can do a little circle there and every direction you look, there's a really fascinating tree that uh, you won't typically see anywhere else. They're not common in city parks or obviously not in our forests or anything else. Uh, and, and then you keep going in that direction. And if you follow all the little signs, like you see in front of the magnolia, say beware of the rare, uh, you'll find all of the other uh, threatened trees that are native to Ontario that we have in our collection here. So um, it's a really good starting point. I know, I know that was cheating. You can ask again, I might have a different answer, but. Um, I'll, yeah, nice, I'll go next. Um, I'll try not to cheat, uh, but yeah, same thing. I, it sort of depends on what you're thinking about, but my, my tree to see would be, um, would be a honey locust uh, because they're uh, a native, native tree. Um, and there's some really nice ones right along the promenade. And one of them is completely and utterly covered. Its whole, its whole trunk is covered in thorns. And these trees are adapted to be, to have their seeds spread by mastodons and mammoths. So it's called an ecological anachronism. And so 
the trees have not realized that their method of seed dispersal has disappeared. And so it's kind of a neat story to, to really look at a tree and think that even though it was thousands of years ago that mastodons and mammoths were in our area, the trees, because they have such long generation times, that they haven't changed. And that may be one of the reasons that uh, honey locusts are um, on the Kasiwik list, um, because they're not, they're not common um, like they used to be. Uh, but they're also great trees because all kinds of different species nest in them. So we had our first uh, blue gray gnat catcher nest in a, our first and only that we know of blue gray gnat catcher nest in uh, one of those trees right there along the promenade. Um, I found um, special spiders on that tree. A new spider to Canada actually was found on one of those trees. Um, uh, Eustala rosier, which is uh, one of the orb weavers, and it actually looks like lichen, like it's green and black and really quite pretty. Uh, I've seen tree the tree frogs hide on that tree, and uh, there's different lichen species that use those trees. So it's actually going to be a topic. I'm going to possibly make a poster or interpretive sign, I haven't decided yet, but on the biodiversity of a single tree. And it's, I'm going to use one of those trees to do it with because it's such a great, such a great tree to talk about. So, uh, Kitty, what about you? What's, what, what are you going to pick? I was going to say honey locust too, actually. You stole my answer. But yeah, honey locust, uh, it's amazing. Like Chris said, it's covered in thorns and that is to protect itself from the mastodons and woolly mammoths that will come up to the tree to eat the fruit uh, and therefore disperse the seeds. But overexcited woolly mammoths and mastodons might run the danger of pushing the tree over and that's not what the tree wants. And unlike animals who can run away to protect themselves, uh, the plants can't move. They're rooted to the ground. It's a little bit trickier for them. So they have these massive thorns uh, to protect themselves from woolly mammoths and mastodon that might push them over uh, and that's actually what we call now an ecological anachronism so it's an adaptation uh, that has evolved with another animal but uh, its partner is now gone so that adaptation is now obsolete it doesn't make it, uh, it doesn't have any role anymore it doesn't make any sense anymore but they're still there because of course uh, the trees haven't caught up to the fact that those uh megafauna are now extinct nowadays. So when you walk by those trees, it's a really cool reminder that we don't have elephants in Ontario nowadays, but we once had their prehistoric ancestors. We're walking on the same ground that woolly mammoths once walked on and mastodons once walked on. And it's a really cool um, example of evolution in play as well. And it's constantly um, happening today, even though you might not realize it because some of those trees are really covered in thorns and others are not. Some of, if uh, you walk along a main promenade uh, in the world of trees collection, we have a grove of honey locust trees and some of them are really thorny and others have barely any thorns at all. And that's because a long time ago, the trees with the most thorns, those are ones that were survived because they weren't pushed over by the woolly mammoths and mastodons. So that they all grew these big, big thorns. But nowadays there's no selection pressure for that anymore. Uh, the trees with not as many thorns still get to live. They still grow up. So you see some trees that, that may not have as many thorns as other trees. Uh, so that's a really cool example of evolution in play as well. So really, really cool story to be told by that tree there. Um, so I have to say, Chris, I, I'm with you on that one. Honey locust is my favorite for sure. Jenny, what about you? We're really three for three on the interp team here with favorite tree. My favorite tree, also honey locust, um, <laughs> has a cool story to tell. Uh, it looks really cool with thorns that you walk past that tree. It's hard not to notice it. And also I feel like it's just like a little bit nostalgic for me. It was one of the first trees I was taught about joining the Arboretum team as a naturalist intern. And I always like show kids on it, um, show kids on walks with this tree uh, when they come to the Arboretum and all the kids always love it. They're like, wow, this was around when um, mastons and mammoths are around. So it's always like a bit of a program favorite. So the nostalgia really gets me for that tree. So also the honey locust for me. Okay, Michelle, how about you? Don't pick honey locusts. Wouldn't it be just hilarious if I said honey locust tree? Not allowed. Not allowed. <laughs> but no, I think for me, what comes to mind most recently would be shadbark hickory. And that's for two reasons. One, I really like the look and the texture of its bark to see 
the mature trees have that crackly and like almost peeling bark and that visually appeals to me and also to touch it's quite nice but also to go along the same lines that Chris was saying with the biodiversity of really any given native tree I think if you pointed me in the direction of any native tree and gave me some time to learn about it to learn all the different interactions and how important any given tree is for so so many different animals um, especially looking at the diversity of insects that will utilize a native tree uh, really is fascinating for me so I really appreciate the shag bark hickory because it's visually looks really cool it has some pretty nice texture to it and also because it's such a an important tree since it's native it supports quite a lot of different animals in our area. Nice. And I think, I don't know if anyone else wants to add their favorite tree in the arb. I think we can go to the next question. Awesome. Um, pretty well. <laughs> so oh, another question in the chat, is there a gypsy moth invasion at the arboretum? Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I would say re relatively speaking, I mean, yes, it's the worst it's ever been here. Uh, it's definitely not as bad as other parts of Ontario get it. Um, they, they, they usually, uh, they prefer oak trees. So areas that have mature oak forests, uh, many species of oaks, usually a little bit south of Guelph. We have some, some oaks, obviously, in our urban areas, and we have some bur oaks in, in, uh, in our natural areas around here. Um, that's their first choice. So areas south of us, kind of Hamilton uh, area and Niagara region, they're, they're getting absolutely hammered this year. Um, we're getting hammered as bad as we ever have. Um, they're coming for our oaks. They like to go for poplars and they're going on willows and then they drop down to choke cherries and crab apples and then anything else they can eat. So I think as Chris said, we're seeing more than we ever have. Um, we're fortunate that it's not as bad as it could be. So. Mm -hmm. Along the same lines, a question that often gets asked is how can people get rid of gypsy moths in their uh, own backyards? Yeah, the, e the, the easiest thing you can do is, is obviously watch for them. So when they're, when they're small and young, if you have a small plant, you can just pick them off the plant and you know, drop them into a bucket of soapy water. Um, you can do the same thing later in the season, you'll see egg masses on the tree. So, so right now the, the caterpillars are heading into their, their pubation stage. And then the moths will hatch and then they'll start laying eggs and we'll see later in the summer and fall the uh, these kind of fuzzy little kind of whitish tan uh, egg masses on on trunks of trees and you can scrape those off as well when it's a big tree there's not a whole lot you can do um, some of you've probably heard about aerial spray programs using uh, btk which is a type of bacteria that will kill them but uh, I know Chris can speak to this more it also kills other things and it also disrupts ecological balance of um, of, of basically the, you know, the food chain where a lot of things are starting to rely on consuming these things. And then all of a sudden we have that population crash too. So it's interventions, even though the, the trees might look better, um, it does cause other impacts as well. So big healthy trees typically can handle being completely defoliated. They'll come back. Stress trees don't always, but it's, it's always that careful balance of us trying to help and then maybe making some other things worse down the road. So, you know, what you can do in your home garden is certainly Kind of what you can do by hand as best you can on your smaller plants so yeah and so something that i do so i have um a dwarf chink of oak in my front yard which is yeah getting hammered so what i do is i go out and pick them and i know some people don't like the the picking part um they're not too keen but so if you have like salad tongs that have like a little bit of a plasticky sort of end to them. Don't tell my wife, I have not told her that I do this, but I use these salad tongs and it's amazing how fast and you get really good at it. I sort of feel like I'm, you know, some type of bird, you know, little warbler beak, you know, trying to grab things, but I can really grab it. So with one hand, I hold like a, a, a jar with some soap and water and then I can grab one, drop it, grab from, and I can get, I can, you know, pick up a hundred caterpillars like really quickly. So uh, yeah, just if you want a fun technique and want to feel like a bird beak, then I suggest using something like this because it's, uh, it's a pretty great way of, of grabbing a bunch of them. Because um, I find if you're not grabbing them well, then they drop and then you got to try and find them. Um, so I really like uh, the, the salad tone method if you want something to, <laughs> for your lower, your lower trees. Excellent. Um, another email, another question that I emailed was, I recently removed trees from my property and I'm looking to replace them. 
where could I find more information about which trees to plant most suitable for my area and for my soil and zone? Yeah, that's a good question. There's there's a lot of um, different resources out there. There's some, some fantastic books um, that, especially if you're looking at, at native plants, um, you know, sometimes even field guides do have some specifics about habitat you can try to match up. But, but one book I really like that has a little bit more anecdotes in it is uh, Trees of the Carolinian Forest by Jerry Waldron, which um, is a, it's a really neat, neat book that just kind of describes a lot of our more interesting native plants and rare ones and, and, and where they grow. And then of course, how you could uh, try to match the site to, to your garden as well. Um, more broadly speaking for kind of Eastern North American books, there's uh, Native Trees and, and Shrubs and Vines by William Kalina, which really comes from more of a, a gardening standpoint. So it has all of our native Ontario uh, species that you'd expect to find, sugar maples and red oaks and all those things, but a lot of really interesting things beyond that. And it really gets into garden culture as well. So those kind of details. Um, certainly things like uh, the Arboretum website, we have some information on, on different trees and shrubs as well. Uh, Garden Centers, Landscape Ontario, uh, they, they have some guides on there that will describe um, different species and, and kind of where they are most suitable to grow. So which like drier sites, which like wetter sites. So, uh, you know, there's, I wouldn't say there's that one perfect resource. Um, uh, that would be great and easy, but it'd also be less fun. It's sometimes nice to go to different resources and kind of pick up some tidbits uh, here and there. But those are definitely some good ones to start with that, that I would use myself as well. And something else you can try is try and find a local wild area that has the same conditions. Um, and when you go there, ignore the invasive species because mm -hmm. chances are there are going to be invasive species there. But um, it, you may get a good idea of what type of thing might grow on your site if you go to something that's similar, um, that's local. So that if you're that way, you can have some local species, but then you can also have some maybe sort of special Carolinian species, like Sean's talking about, um, in on your property. Um, but yeah, like he said, sticking native is is going to be your best bet for the majority of your woody plants because that's going to be the best ecologically and for the growing um, conditions of of where you are. So yeah, excellent. Um, another right. question. Oh, Sorry, I was okay. just going to jump in really quickly. Um, while we're in a bit of a break between questions, I want to revisit Don's question about his lemon tree. His pictures did come through. Um, so I'm actually going to share my screen and hopefully we can all look at those pictures and see if we can figure them out. So if at any point um, my shared screen is not working for any reason, then feel free to just unmute yourself and let me know since I can't see your full screen um, once I'm screen sharing. We can see it. Perfect. These are the different uh. lemon tree pictures. Yeah, I, I, I can't speak specifically for, uh, I guess, those necrotic kind of brown ends that you'd see on the ends of your of some of those leaves, Don. But generally speaking, I am still seeing good shoot growth on there, which is a good sign. Um, and I am wondering whether it was uh, that more environmental kind of changeover that the, the tree, you know, I don't want to say shock per se, but whether it was a uh, some of the experiences we had, I'm not sure when your tree went out this year, but we had a lot of yo-yoing with, you know, really, really warm spring and then all of a sudden frost for a few days and then really, really warm again and dropping. And whether that impacted things a little bit and, and some of those leaves that had adjusted either to the indoor um, conditions you had earlier in the year just weren't efficiently doing what the tree wanted to do, but it looks like the regrowth is good, and that would be something I, I, I wouldn't necessarily be expecting to see as much of a real systemic root rot problem. Um, I guess what you could do if you're worried about kind of the how it's uh, maybe a little bit more bare on the interior and things like that, you, you could do a little bit of structural pruning and, and, and cause some internal shoots to kind of uh, even things back out in the future. But um, looking at it right now, I'm not sure if this photo is really recent. I'm, I'm not looking at that and thinking it's got a death sense. I'm thinking it's, it's made some adjustments. It's, uh, it's trying to regrow and, uh, and, and get its feet set again. So I, I think that's a good sign for sure. Okay, yeah, I just took the pictures uh, last week. So 
usually when I put it out, like I put it out, I think just after May 2, 4 to avoid a lot of that cold weather. But uh, usually I put it out and then suddenly the tree just like it blows up. I see a lot of green shoots starting and, mm -hmm. and a lot of the shoots that you see there, like on top, on the top left, it looks like it started new shoots, but all those leaves fall off. Oh, I see. Okay. So in that top, uh, I'm looking at it sideways here a little bit, but I'm looking at, I guess, what would be the, the top right of the tree, but it's actually the top left corner of the screen here. I'm seeing yeah. a shoot there that maybe it's looked like it's dropped some leaves a little bit, eh? Yeah. Okay. Um, and again, I, I wish I could say I've, I've got more professional experience with the citrus trees to see if there's a specific affliction that actually impacts them in a way that, that uh, I've had a chance to experience at the Arboretum. But um, uh, I, was, I was expecting a little bit worse. And that's the, the, the good sign, I would say, is that, uh, you know, those can certainly be concerns, but it's not obviously completely uncommon for, for citrus trees and a lot of tropical trees in, in our environment to kind of drop leaves for sometimes really subtle little stresses here. So I'd say keep an eye on it. If you do have a chance to, to pull it out of the pot, you know, gently just so you can see if there is, um, you know, any tips of those roots. I know you said it was a solid mass inside of there, but uh, anything that looks like it's getting a little bit mushy because that will continue to spread if that's the case. But if, um, if you're not seeing that, then, then you should be able to cancel that out and uh, just try to find that, that watering balance and see if it bounces back as it gets used to the growing season again. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. It looks actually nice and green and healthy otherwise. So, yeah, yeah they can often get really chlorotic. So, uh, so you've been doing at least a good job of keeping it looking nice and green. All right. Perfect. While I am on a screen sharing spree, um, we also have a mystery tree from Don from his cottage. If anybody wants to flex their uh, plant ID muscles. <laughs> Ah, yes. So that's a, it's a little black walnut tree, uh, Juglans nigra. So I shouldn't say little tree, but little, little nuts. Those will get, <laughs> those would be bigger later in the season. So um, yeah, Juglans nigra, that's the, the common black walnut. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and fortunately, our audio file is a little too big to um, send. So our mystery bird will be a little bit of a mystery for a while longer. <laughs> All righty. Um, I'll go back to a question that gets emailed quite often to us is, should I and how do I report a dead bird? Oh, yeah, so that's actually a, a good question. So if, um, if the dead bird has hit a window, um, i.e. it didn't die from some type of disease, it just hit a window, then um, if it's, especially if it's an uncommon bird, um, or, um, or has something strange about it, like maybe part, some of the feathers are all white or something like that. Um, you can contact us at the Arboretum. Um, I do take, um, birds, uh, dead birds, and then get them to the, uh, the zoology museum on campus, which, uh, so they can be made into study skins. Um, we only take birds that are, that have died recently because, uh, if they've started to, uh, decompose, then we can't make a study skin out of them. So then it's a little bit of a drag. So if anyone does find a, a freshly, uh, dead bird, um, like in that, a situation like that, that, and, you know, we have a lot of robins, so, so we don't need any more robins. Um, so yeah, it would need to be something just a little bit more uncommon than that. Um, if you put it into a Ziploc bag um, with a little note that just says where you find it, um, what your name is, uh, maybe some contact information and the date, um, then that's really good. Um, some birds, if they are just found dead and they otherwise look healthy, um, they could have died from disease. And uh, sometimes pathology at uh, the Ontario Veterinary College is interested in specific species because they may be following um, an, outbreak, an outbreak of West Nile virus, for example. So especially things like blue jays and crows, um, they're often interested in getting submissions from that. So you can contact um, the uh, uh, OVC, so the Ontario Veterinary College, about that, and they will get you to the right person um, to see if they are interested in, in getting the dead bird from you. So yeah, great questions. Thank you. 
Um, another question in the chat is, are there any viburnum trees at the ARB? Yes, yes, we actually have quite a few. Um, I guess first and foremost, there's a few spots that we would call viburnum tree collections. So uh, we have a, a family collection called the Caprifoliaceae or Doxaceae family collection, which is the honeysuckles and viburnums. And it's a, an area uh, off of our main entrance off of College Avenue, uh, as you're heading in towards the Arboretum Center, you'll see it to the left. It's, um, it's not a highly developed collection. A lot of it was planted earlier in the 70s and, and we haven't uh, had done a lot of development over the years, but you can kind of wander through there and, and see some of the viburnums. Uh, some of the challenges we've had cultivating them here is viburnum leaf beetles. So we've had a number of them that um, have been planted over the years and, and really, really uh, challenged by being defoliated year after year by, by those. But, um, but there are some to visit there. In the center of the World of Trees collection, there are a number of viburnums as well. So I think uh, Justine had actually mentioned in the chat, there's a, a new map, a new sign, so that can give you a bit of a clue where to find them there. But they're fairly central in the middle of the World of Trees collection. Uh, we have a few of them in our Gosling Wildlife Gardens, so uh, a couple of um, kind of ornamental Asian species and a number of the native species as well. And then you can kind of find them throughout the grounds also. So um, if you're wandering some of our trails through some of our uh, Wall Customs Memorial Forest areas and other kind of wild naturalized plantings, uh, one that you're most likely to come across is the nanny berry or Viburnum lentego. That is one that is actually uh, native to the Guelph area. So they're very happy here. They grow very well here and we have some big, big bushy ones. Um, there are a couple of uh, the relatives that are in some of our old meadows that aren't native, uh, Viburnum lantana, sometimes called wayfaring tree. And uh, we consider them to be invasive, although not nearly as invasive as things like dog strangling vine or buckthorns, but you will come across them as well. And just this morning, actually, I was working on some little seedlings um, that we've been growing uh, from some seeds of Viburnum trilobum. Uh, which is our, our American highbush cranberry. And these are some seeds I collected up in Manitoulin Island a few years ago uh, from some pure uh, American highbush cranberries. Uh, what we often see definitely in garden centers, but even growing in the wild now are European highbush cranberries or hybrids between American and European highbush cranberries. So very exciting when we get a pure native one. And, uh, and those, those are in our nursery right now, but they will be ending up in one of our collections very soon as well. So yes, the, you, you can definitely find them around the Arboretum and a number of them that have labels in some of those collections too. Awesome. Another question um, I recently got asked while I was out and about walking, I didn't really know the answer to, is do rose-breasted ghost beaks nest in the Arb? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so I'm pretty sure we have had records of them uh, I've never found a nest, but they have been sighted at going to like our bird feeders in the summertime, for example. So they do, they must nest somewhere. Um, I haven't found one yet on the survey. We didn't find one on in the Arboretum on that first point count survey, did we? Does anybody remember that? I don't think so. Um, this year is the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas, um, the first year for the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas um, for the third atlas. Um, and it's something that happens every 20 years. Um, and is five years long. Um, and yeah, so I will be watching to see if we can find rose-breasted ghost beaks. They should nest in the Arboretum. Um, I, have, I have them uh, nesting where I live in Rockwood. So uh, we should have them in the Arboretum, but I haven't actually found a nest yet. So um, I'd have to go back into some of the older records to see, to see if we have uh, any, any real nest records. So, so great question. So likely, uh, but uh, I haven't found one yet this year. Well, I'll have to keep our eyes peeled for that. <laughs> um, another question that got emailed in is, when do species become, go from being invasive to naturalized? Yeah, I guess uh, and this is something we, Chris and I, uh, we might both have different answers to this. I'd say there's no real um, true answer to that because I think uh, an invasive species, that term, uh, we typically refer to it as something that's exotic, so it wasn't part of our native flora, that has come in here and started invading our natural areas and, and out competing our native species. There are some native species, though, that people consider invasive. So uh, things like sumacs or trembling aspens can be considered invasive if they're invading an area that you wish they weren't <laughs> and they're spreading in too far. So even that, that, that term can be a little bit vague. Um, naturalized, though, typically would refer to, to, to something that has uh, essentially gone through multiple cycles. Um, it's reproducing in the wild. It's kind of integrating uh, sometimes invasively with our native flora. 
Um, so something that would be naturalized would, uh, would be something I mentioned earlier, uh, Viburnum lantana. So it is kind of naturalized in our landscape. It's invasive, but it's not horribly invasive. It doesn't kind of push out all of our native species. It usually comes into disturbed areas that we've already, as humans, uh, created these, these kind of uh, altered landscapes. So that would be something I would consider naturalized because it is reproducing, birds are eating the berries, they're spreading and popping up. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think that's kind of one of those vague terms that we can kind of apply how we want, but essentially something that is reproducing generation after generation on its own, it, it would be considered naturalized. Doesn't mean it's native, but uh, it typically means they're here to stay. <laughs> um, some invasive species, if we get to them early enough, we can quarantine things and kind of nip things in the bud, we can prevent them from becoming naturalized. But there's a number of things like buckthorns that are, uh, they're, they're here to stay. I don't think we'll ever eliminate buckthorns from Ontario at this point, so they would be considered naturalized. And, and also, they happen to be very invasive, so. So in, in the definition of, um, in what, like, so invasive species, so species can be invasive, but uh, often the definition of an invasive species is, is one of the things Sean was talking about, is that it's taking over another species. So um, in sort of uh, like from a scientific term, when you talk about an invasive species, it's a species that is naturalized, but it has a huge like, effect um, on the ecology of the site that it's naturalizing in. So where, um, so dandelions, for example, would be naturalized, but really dandelions aren't, they're not causing a problem except for people who want pristine lawns, um, but that doesn't really count as, uh, as an ecological disaster. Um, uh, whereas buckthorn, because they're taking up so much space of native plants um, and, and pushing out like native shrubs, they would be considered an invasive species. So it depends on how you use, use the word, but there is an actual invasive species definition that's used for um, different insects. So for example, honeybees, everyone loves honeybees, but honeybees are a huge invasive species. So they are a massive problem for native bee species. So uh, yeah, so we, yeah, you have to look at an invasive species, not just from human terms, like we love honey, so how could a honeybee be invasive? But it's actually a problem for other native bee species. So that's, that's one of the ways of looking at, uh, at the word invasive species as well. Sure. Yeah, and I think from a, from a home gardening standpoint too, there's a lot of things that we label as invasive because they spread really rapidly. And, and some of those things can be invasive and get out of your yard into natural areas. And some of them are just, you know, don't plant this in your yard or you never be able to plant anything else around it too. So we often use that term invasive and those can be native species or non-native species, but they're just, uh, they have aggressive growth patterns sometimes. So yeah, it, uh, it can apply in different ways for sure. Yeah. All righty. And another question that we've been asked recently is, are there any volunteer opportunities at the ARB right now? So we have, um, we have had to sort of put a toggle on our volunteering here because of COVID, um, but we are hoping to be able to start uh, getting, getting some volunteering happening again. So it will be slow. We'll be doing things uh, slowly as we slowly open up from, from, from the pandemic conditions that we had before. Um, but yeah, you can always contact the Arboretum, uh, send a message to um, say arbor at uoguelph.ca if you are interested in volunteering and we can get you to the right person um, so that when things open up you'll be able to be contacted so that we can say yay yes we can have you um, come out and do this or you can help us work on that that type of thing but right now it's difficult at least to, to do volunteering that that would happen on the grounds got it and uh, another question that got emailed in was, I'm looking to purchase rove beetles for use with my indoor culture isopod. Um, I'm wondering if they could be purchased through you or if you could recommend a local supplier. I do not know of a supplier of rove beetles. So yeah, um, you got me there. I'm not sure. 
Sean, have you ever come across someone wanting to buy row fetals? No, I mean, I guess I, when I even think of uh, where to purchase insects in general, uh, um, you know, there's a few suppliers I know provincially, uh, like BioBest or Natural Insect Control, who will sell, you know, beneficial insects and you can buy eggs and things like that. And then some pet stores, you know, terrarium specialties will have things, but but no, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't know specifically where you get real fields. No. Yeah. So we failed you. There's a failed question right there. <laughs> Um, another question is why do humans react to poison ivy, but other animals don't? Oh, well, you have asked two people who know all about reacting to poison ivy. Sean and I are quite good at doing that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so it's really just, it just has to do with, um, with the oils, um, on the plant, uh, the oils are probably in the plant to deter um, insects from, from eating the plant. Um, it's not there, they, they, it's, um, uh, what is it, Ushiol, is that right? Um, yeah, no, no, Ushiol, yeah. yeah. So it's, the plant isn't producing that to stop us from walking through it. That's something that probably has just happened that humans or some humans, such as Sean and I, um, are, are very allergic to that oil. Um, but the oil is, is there probably as like a defensive mechanism so that the plant isn't, isn't eaten. So other animals probably don't react to it. One, because they don't have as much bare, bare skin to get the oils on. So the oils would get on their fur instead of getting onto their bare skin. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's probably just mostly um, well, but you know, you could still have dogs that could be sick because every, everything could have an allergy depending on, on, uh, you know, their immune system and that type of thing. But yeah, it's, it's, I'm guessing it has more to do with the fact that we have bare skin and for some reason react to the oil, um, and wild animals would have adapted to not react to it. Um, but it could still be irritating to their, to their mucous membranes and stuff if they tried to eat it, for example. So that would be another reason why the oils would be there. But we're not out eating poison ivy. We're just out walking through it and then end up with that oozy, horrible rash that I can already see Sean and I were already like, because it's, oh, yes. it's no fun. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I spent a few hours walking through patches about six feet high um, last week. And um, I've learned tricks to... Because I'm through it all the time, but ways to avoid actually reacting because I have reacted. But um, from what I understand, it, it's it's primates specifically that are, are sensitive. So humans, I guess, if we had some gorillas and chimpanzees and things here, they would maybe react to. But it's it's it as Chris mentioned, it's very much like an immune response, an allergic response. And for whatever reason, we we uh, when the oil, the root oil, uh, it, when we have it on or so whatever else, our body goes into hyperdrive. Uh, so sometimes you can actually get it on your arm and then it'll show up on your legs and things too. It's because your body's reacting to the presence of the oil. Um, and other animals don't seem to in the same way. And again, they're probably, as Chris mentioned, they're not being exposed, you know, having it right on their skin directly. But um, yeah, it's, it's interesting how our bodies um, have these immune responses to things. I'm also, you know, fascinated. We can eat chocolate, but it's toxic to dogs. Why is that? Like just all these different things that we can share and then things that we can't. So um, so yeah, just be cautious. The lesson I've learned around poison ivy, recognize it and you're okay. Just be respect it. Um, if you disrespect it someday, it might get you for sure. <laughs> yeah. And if, if you don't know, um, most people, um, at least, at least I have at least a couple hours to have a soapy shower. If I've known I've gone through it. Um, and if I use lots of soap, which breaks down the oil, then I don't react. So it seems to have to be on at least for me, this is my skin for a few hours at least for it to actually cause an effect. So literally, if I have to go through a forest for a survey or something and it's full of poison ivy, I go home, I walk directly into the laundry room, I strip down, put my clothes directly into the washing machine so no one else has to touch them, and then go have a soapy shower so that I can get all the oils off of my skin. And that has worked. Um, touch wood, I'm touching wood. Um, there's some right there. Uh, so that has worked quite well for me for the last you know, couple decades. I've only had it a few times. And I used to get it all the time. So, but never ever go through a patch of poison ivy and go, oh, that was poison ivy. And then go to a stream or a lake and try and wash it off with just some water because that just spreads the oil around and then you're in worse trouble. So, so yeah, keep yeah. that in mind.
Awesome. <laughs> Those were some really good tips for anyone who maybe comes across poison ivy a lot. Uh, another question is, what inspired or motivated the design of the gardens in the Arboretum? Oh, well, I guess uh, there's a number of answers to those questions because we have different gardens kind of from different eras and different, um, uh, I guess, different intentions and things. So uh, there are some gardens, spaces and kind of displayers that have sort of evolved organically as far as uh, spaces around some of our buildings, for example. Uh, we have our formal collections, which are part of a larger curatorial plan with, with ideas of kind of what we want to be able to display in there. Uh, then we have things like our really formal gardens. So our English, Italian and, and Japanese gardens, which uh, are, are trying to follow, you know, themes of, of those kind of traditional designs that, that you'd see in those types of gardens. Uh, and then our Gosling Wildlife Gardens, which are meant to be uh, more of a kind of uh, you know, dis display demonstration gardens that can show what you can do to increase biodiversity in your backyard and, and wildlife interactions and, and garden inspiration and things like that as well. And, and some of that uh, design work has been through uh, student competitions. Um, so I say competitions, en engaging landscape architecture students at the University of Guelph to kind of provide ideas and then select from some of those. We've worked with professional landscape architects and then obviously with the Arboretum staff, um, kind of taking some of the best ideas, uh, taking some ideas that we would have and as far as how to apply that so that we can maintain things effectively. And, and also, we, we also love to have the chance to display plants that wouldn't be on a typical garden design uh, because we often grow things you can't buy at garden centers and get at nurseries. So it's always like a chance to, to do something really special. So it's, it's been a, a bit of a mix of all of those things. And um, over 50 years, we've kind of had these, these things evolve uh, to the point they are today. And probably along the same lines of, uh, you mentioned the Gosling Gardens. Uh, how do I attract more birds to my yard? Oh, well, I'm going to say uh, there's lots of ways you can do that. I'm going to let Chris jump into that because he is the pro for sure. So, <laughs> um, and that's not true. Sean knows too, but uh, basically your, your best bet, like we've talked about native species, if you want to attract birds, they're already adapted to eat a whole bunch of native species. So the more native species you have in your yard, the more birds you're going to attract. So uh, my backyard... Why don't I try, let's see if I can do this. I'm going to try and carry my computer. Look at this, oh, field trip. Um, so I'm going to carry my computer over here. And look at that. It's like we planned this. Now, we're, I don't know if my Wi-Fi should still work out here, but so here is my backyard. And you can see that I have a whole bunch of bird feeders. Plus I have a lot of different structures. So this was all pretty well lawn when I moved here and I have put a whole bunch of things. So um, most of the things I've put in are native but I was able to get these blue spruce which are really good for nesting habitat for birds. But I've planted things like, um, I've, I've got to keep looking over my shoulder because of the glare. So I have uh, things like uh, birches. I've got uh, alternate leaf dogwood because they produce lots of berries. I have vines such as grapevine and uh, Virginia creeper. You can see I have dead trees, so I grow trees and then kill them. Yeah, so that's nice, eh? Um, and that's because that allows a whole bunch of different vines to grow up them so that uh, we get lots of berry producing uh, grapes, Virginia creeper, um, uh, American bittersweet. Uh, and I have lots of things way out there. So all kinds of things, cup plants and uh, walnuts, white pine, um, all, all kinds of stuff. So that's really going to help you attract birds. Um, having the feeders is really good as well. So that, that's, that's obviously a nice bonus point for getting, whoa, sorry, almost tripped over a dog, um, for getting lots of birds to come to your, to your area. But, you know, once again, it's, it's really structure, having different herbaceous plants, um, different um, woody plants, providing water, all those different things are, are really great for getting, getting birds into your backyard. And I've had over a hundred different species um, in my backyard. So uh, you can too. Awesome. Your yard, it's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> it's um... a little wild. 
And I believe those are all the questions that I can see in the chat. And those are all the questions I had banked through emails and other sources. I don't know if anyone else, if you've been holding on to your questions, this is an excellent time to pop them in the chat. While we wait for more questions to come in for the last couple of minutes, I know Justine did share about our new World of Trees map sign at the Arboretum. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, it's just along the promenade if you're visiting the Arboretum, but this way you guys can have a look at what our new exciting sign looks like because it's pretty nice. This is what it looks like right here. It's really, it's, so it's a great sign, not only to orient yourself to where um, different plant families are found in the world of trees, but the information on the sign, there's so much information. Um, uh, so Polly, uh, who's a, a longtime staff member at the Arboretum, uh, designed and, and did the writing. Just, it's an amazing sign. It's really, really great. So uh, you definitely want to check it out the next time you're going along our promenade. Uh, you can learn so much about plants and how families work and how they're classified and and where there are examples. It's, uh, it's more than just a map to where you are. And I'm not seeing any more questions pop up in the chat. Uh, so it looks like we, we may be out of questions. I don't know if anyone else has anything else to add. Nope, uh, thank you all for, for coming and, and asking your questions. We, uh, we, we appreciate your curiosity about uh, the Arboretum and uh, nature and horticulture. So, so thank you very much for coming. Did you need to finish off with anything, um, uh, Michelle? Do you have any final remarks? No, just look out for maybe another one of these events in the future. Um, it's a lot of fun for us, and hopefully it was a lot of fun for you guys. Uh, so like Chris said, thank you so much for spending the past hour with us talking all about nature. We had fun. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks. See you later.